right? And then the next day, the graduate students um, asked me, have you looked into public health? And I was like, what? Because at almost 22 years old, I had never heard of public health or epidemiology, right? And that's crazy. Mm -hmm. um, so that seed was just planted there. And then I started looking into it. And I'm like, you know what? This is, I think this is something that I might like, right? Because as I was researching what was public health, I stumbled upon one of those, this is public health campaign. Mm -hmm. And someone over there said, you are only as healthy as the world around you. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that phrase really, I, it really hit me, like it really impacted me. And I'm like, yeah, this is what I want to do, right? Like prevention is better than the remedy. Uh, let, let's do this. This is the Public Health Millennial Career Stories Podcast, where you'll hear about diverse career stories, career strategies, get tips, and learn from others to help you in your public health career journey. If you want to learn about public health, public health careers, or just hear public health stories, stay tuned because you won't want to miss this. Welcome to the Public Health Millennial Career Stories Podcast, episode number 32. Hi everyone, my name is Omari Richards and I hope that everyone has a great and happy new year. I think this is the last episode that uh, before the new year. I know that 2020 was a crazy one, but I know 2021 is going to come with a lot of blessings, a lot of great things for a lot of people. I hope that you all are staying healthy, staying safe, your families are doing the same and that you all are looking forward to 2021, all the great blessings that are going to be coming that way for each and every one of us all. Um, so thank you all for tuning in to this podcast. I really appreciate it. And I appreciate everything that uh, you do. So definitely subscribe, leave a review, share this with a friend, and I appreciate you all. So happy new year. And without further ado, here's today's episode. Today, we have a bilingual public health professional. She got her bachelor's of biology from Universidad de Puerto Rico, and then went on to get her master of public health from the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston School of Public Health. She has worked as a bilingual nutrition educator, as well as securing a CDC CSTE Applied Epidemiology Fellowship for the Hawaii State Department of Health. She currently works as a vector-borne disease surveillance and response coordinator slash epidemiologist for the Hawaii State Department of Health. She started her podcast, Meho con Guanabanas, where you can follow her and her podcast on Instagram at Meho con Guanabanas. We have Nianest Alus, MPH. Welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah. I, I, you did your LinkedIn work homework, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to I'm, I'm glad to have you on the show too. Uh, I know we connect uh, definitely as, as uh, professionals before and I just enjoy talking to you. So I'm glad I get to like ask you about your story and your public health path. So this is awesome. Yeah, I'm glad to share it. Yeah, but as many people as, as can, I can help, if they listen to my story just because like I my my road to public health wasn't a straight one so <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, feel, I feel like that's a story for so so many people and I feel like just telling here letting people hear these kind of stories definitely helps them to want to pursue public health which I think more people should get into so how how are you and how have you been coping during these times I am good yeah I've been hanging in there but um, overall, I'm good. I'm happy to have a job, uh, which I like, right? Uh, I guess uh, I'm in, a, in the public health field. Uh, it's easy to love, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I'm glad that you like your job. <laughs> that, that's always a, a good thing to have, and I'm glad that you still have your job as well. Uh, so how, how do you identify? And uh, tell us a little bit about your personal background. Uh, yeah, so I am from Puerto Rico, uh, born and raised in the island. I moved to the mainland United States uh, for grad school. Um, and then I, I really like uh, science, biology, public health. Uh, among my hobbies, I have, I like to paint like watercolors and do urban sketching. 
and then uh, before the whole pandemic happened, uh, I used to do jujitsu, which I really love to. Um, yeah, just a public health professional, uh, maybe not super early career, but right now I'm like in that transition uh, from early career epidemiologist to like mid-level. Okay, and that's awesome. And uh, that's definitely cool that you have so many different interests. Like, have you always been that way? And, and is, is that something that you advocate other people should do? Like have different interests and like pursue that while they're doing everything else? Yeah, I've always been that way. Sometimes I think, I don't know if it's helpful or, or <laughs> not, just because my interests shift so much. But I guess it's, it's good because I get to try many things. And so I can connect with a lot of people, okay. especially for networking, right? Like one time I heard that when you're in a networking session, like it's usually people like to ask, oh, so what do you do, right? Like, what, what are you working on? Uh, but I heard, I can remember now that you can also start a conversation with like, what do you like to do for fun? Mm -hmm. Because it, it, it makes you connect better uh, to the people that you're talking to. Yeah, definitely. And I feel like sometimes we get carried away by making ourselves our job or making our jobs ourselves, but we are two separate things and they should be yeah. kept separate because we, we are a lot more than just the work that we do, you know? Yeah, and, and, and when you start talking about strictly work in a networking setting, it becomes kind of like a competition. Mm -hmm. Oh, I've done this, I've done that. Uh, but if you ask people, oh, what do you like to do for fun? Then everyone has something that they like to do for fun. So they're all starting like at the same level. Mm -hmm. I, didn't, I didn't think about that. That was, that was cool. Uh, thank, thanks for mentioning that. That's awesome. So what does public health mean to you? Okay. So for me, it means everything. And I'm not, this is not the answer that's romanticizing. <laughs> oh, it, it's everything in my life, right? No, it, it's literally, I can see public health everywhere, right? Anything can be public health. Everything can be public health if you give it that perspective because everyone wants to live healthier and better and, because everyone's trying to achieve that or they think they're trying to achieve that uh, sense of well-being for the community, you can see public health working in everything, like, like in the structure, in the uh, environmental health, right? Like the helmet, when you see uh, someone riding their bicycle or the security belts uh, when driving. So it's little, it can be everything. That's, that's what it means to me. Okay. And of course, like, I love it so much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. And, and, and that is just so true. Public health is everything. And, enough, and I feel like we don't know it's everything until we really know what public health is. And then when you do know what public health is, you're like, oh, it's in almost like everything that's going on here. Yeah, it changes your whole perspective, how you look at things, right? Like mm -hmm. how, how the lanes are separated, the bicycle lanes, the sidewalks. If you go to a community that do not have a sidewalk, then, oh, well, this is a public health problem, right? Like, because mm -hmm. it doesn't allow for um, physical activity or it doesn't, it, it decreases the walkability of the place. So, yeah. yeah. Awesome. So you, you got your bachelor's of biology slash biomedical sciences from the Universidad, Universidad de Puerto Rico. So what was your thought process for getting this degree? my thought process for getting that degree it really there wasn't a thought process just because in puerto rico when you are in high school you have to select three options you have to select your major uh in high school uh, when applying for college so my three options were architecture public relations and accounting uh so biology wasn't at all <laughs> in the picture uh until three months before starting college I was like, I do not want to live far away from home. I do not want to go to any of those programs. So then I went uh, desperately to my uh, closest campus 
And it turns out that they were still accepting uh, applications. So right there, I asked, oh, so what are your degree programs? Mm -hmm. So they gave me a little paper with all the degrees uh, that they offered. And I recognized one that um, I knew my friend applied to. It was quality control. And that's the only thing I read, quality control. And, I, and I'm like, oh, I'll choose that one. Very <laughs> random. I'll choose that one. That's what I'm going to study. Okay, so I applied. I got in. And then the day of orientation, I was with my friend. We were both in the same program. And then the director was like, welcome. You are all biology students. And I'm like, <laughs> I look at my friend. And I'm like, what? We are, we are biology majors. And I had no idea until orientation day. <laughs> Turns out that the program that I had actually applied was quality control, but it was a subconcentration of the biology major. So technically, I had applied to biology. <laughs> and then I was like, well, you know what? I mean, I don't know if I should stay, but I sh I'm going to give it a try. I'm going to roll with it. So then I took all the exams for all the classes that I had that semester. I'm like, oh, that wasn't that bad. I guess I, I, I'm kind of good at this. I'm going to stay in biology. <laughs> so that's how I stayed in biology. And then I just switched my, con my sub-concentration from quality control to biomedical sciences. Um, because I thought, oh, maybe I could just study medicine, right? Like without concentration in biomedical sciences and that was my whole thought process I went there by accident I liked it and I stayed and I finished wow. <laughs> that, yeah yeah I, that, that is amazing that I feel like I was uh, listening to like a movie just now <laughs> yeah. yeah sometimes I, and I'm like sometimes I'm amazed at how I got to where I am hmm. That is true. That is true. So, so during like high school and like your childhood, did you do a lot of biology or not? Not so much. Did you like biology? I liked it, but it wasn't my favorite thing. Like, mm -hmm. like uh, in in third grade, I got frustrated by the science. I'm like, I never want to see science ever again. I hate it so much. In third grade, uh, in high school, I I like chemistry more than biology, and then mm -hmm. geology. Like mm -hmm. chemistry and geology um but when i was applying to college i'm like yeah i don't want to do science mm -hmm. i don't want to <laughs> go into a stem field uh but then <laughs> yeah yeah, up there. It, yeah. Okay, that, that is that, that is amazing. Uh, okay, I'm I'm just mind blown by that, but that is awesome. So it's, yeah. So like I guess <laughs> yeah yeah I guess like here if there's like a learning something to learn is I just like not everything has to be structure, not everything has to be planned. You just have to roll with sometimes with the punches and then just see what happens, right? Because you never know. You have to be open. Absolutely, absolutely, and I, and I think that that is definitely so true. And you can, and you can like not do something. Sometimes you just have to go ahead and start walking, and then you'll figure it out afterwards, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so during your undergrad, you were also involved in like a lot of uh, student organizations. So, what, like, I don't know if you want to name a couple of them and just like talk about what you learned from being involved in these organizations. Yeah. So I was right because midway my bachelor's degree i decided that i was going to study medicine uh and i'm like well i have to compete with all the pre-med students that are around me uh so i just started uh, joining organizations and uh, i joined the american chemistry society as a member i was just a member there uh, i joined the tri tribeta biological society and that was i was vice president there and then I also joined the honors program uh, and I was president of the honors program. Um, and then in my first two years, I was in the volleyball team. So that's, I guess I'm gonna count that as an organization because it took a lot of time too. Uh, but yeah, I guess I learned, I learned organization, like just logistical things. It, 
they might seem small, but like just setting up a, a meeting or who's gonna, who are gonna be the speakers or how are you gonna present this? That's little things that you learn uh, by doing. So just starting early in your career by doing those, it's, it's very helpful. And it looks really good if you're applying to like another graduate program, being involved in those organizations. Okay. Yeah, it definitely, definitely does help just being involved. And, and you do learn those, those kinds of things like meeting minutes and all those little small things that you might not pick up just from like class time, you know? Yeah. And trying to control, you know, like uh, the schedule, like being on time, uh, who gets to talk, uh, how, how much time are you going to give that person to talk and express themselves, uh, trying to collect funds for an activity it's skills that some people think oh they're just students doing that like mm -hmm. playing adults <laughs> <laughs> but it's skills that you are developing because you don't get to develop those skills in class absolutely right? absolutely so so you you got your master's of public health at the university of texas health science center at houston school of public health um but before that when when in your like thought process did public health come up like when, when was that like it had to be during I guess your, your undergrad at some point in time it came up or I don't know T talk to me about that yeah that's another story so you remember that I said that I wanted to study medicine right like mm -hmm. in my second third year of uh, my degree okay but then what happens um in my second year after I finished my second year I did a research like undergraduate research at Purdue University, so like a summer. Uh, and then the next year after I finished my third year, I did another undergraduate research at um, Rutgers University in New Jersey. So then I was like, maybe I don't wanna study medicine. <laughs> so I decided that I was gonna do a PhD in cell and molecular biology, right? So uh, that's what I decided to do. And then, when I applied, I was interested. I was interested in RNA biology, mm -hmm. so I applied to Purdue University because I had already done an internship there. I applied to Rutgers University because I also another internship there. I knew people, uh, and then I applied to UT Austin mm -hmm. because they had a good, what I consider a good RNA biology. Um, good RNA biology mentors or principal mm -hmm. investigators. I'm like, okay, I'll apply to UT Austin. But I, have, I, I, I got accepted to all three of them to do a PhD. And then I was torn because I didn't know if I should go to uh, Purdue University or Rutgers University. Mm -hmm. UT Austin was just there mm -hmm. because <laughs> why not? Uh, but then I was like really torn. I, I was undecided. Should I go to Indiana? Should I go to New Jersey? And then I had a dream. I had a dream. And in that dream, my mentor from Rutgers University uh, and I were talking. And I was asking, I was telling him, oh, I don't know where to go in that dream. And then in the dream, my mentor told me, you should go to UT Austin you will have better opportunities at UT Austin. Mm -hmm. And I was like, in the drum, I was like, no, like, I don't want to go to UT Austin. I don't know anywhere. I don't know anyone there. And, and he's like, no, you, you, you should go to UT Austin. And then when I woke up, I'm like, okay, I'll go to UT Austin. And I accepted UT Austin. <laughs> uh, I moved to UT Austin after graduation from my undergrad degree started my PhD program in cell and molecular biology and I hated it. <laughs> it was like, this is not for me. I don't know how people live like this. Uh, like because it was it was like a lot a lot a lot of time in the lab. And I love being in the lab, but it was just more like that environment of academia and research that I didn't like. So I uh, that I finished my first semester in the PhD program and I was like, you know what? I talking to myself, Nianes, 
you don't like the PhD, you are not going to complete a PhD in cell and molecular biology. You are gonna quit now or you are gonna quit four years down the road. So I decided that it was better for me to quit there, to withdraw from the program after my first year because I had, I had to, to withdraw at a certain period during the year, otherwise I would have to pay back all the classes that okay. I took. Mm -hmm. So I finished my home, my, the, the first year and then I withdrew. The thing is that before I withdrew, I was still in my, in my third lab rotation of the PhD program. One of the graduate students that was helping me mm -hmm. uh, that I didn't, I, I didn't know what to do. Right, and then the next day, the graduate student um, asked me, "Have you looked into public health?" Mm -hmm. And I was like, "What?" Because at almost 22 years old, I had never heard of public health or epidemiology, right? And that's crazy. Mm -hmm. um, so that seed was just planted there. And then I started looking into it. And I'm like, you know what? This is, I think this is something that I might like, right? Because as I was researching what was public health, I stumbled upon one of those, this is public health campaign. Mm -hmm. And someone over there said, you are only as healthy as the world around you. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that phrase really, I, it really hit me, like it really impacted me. And I'm like, yeah, this is what I want to do, right? Like prevention is better than the remedy. Uh, let, let's do this. And uh, I knew I wanted to stay in Austin um, because I, even though I didn't like the PhD program, I really loved Austin. Mm -hmm. uh, so researching programs, I found that the UT School of Public Health, they have um, different campuses across Texas and one of them is in Austin. So I went back home to Puerto Rico. I took a couple of professional development courses at my old um, campus in Aguadilla, and then I applied. Uh, and then the next year I got into the MPH in epidemiology. Uh, and then I, I started um, in epidemiology. And the reason why I choose epidemiology was because, oh, since I have a bench science research, like a bench science background, like molecular biology, biology, I thought that, well, if I went into epidemiology, it was going to be a good transition into public health with my background. And that's the only reason why I selected epidemiology. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> this, is, this is truly remarkable, man. <laughs> I, I did not know that all of that happened, but I'm glad that, yeah. that you share that. Um, so first, first things I want to ask. So you said when you were looking for PhD programs, you were looking to see who had good um, PI um, personnel. So how, how do you go about looking for that, first of all? Just uh, like going into the, the different programs, because um, when one of the things that when I did the internships, right? Like you know graduate students, you go to different conferences and you ask. Uh, and then I won a travel award to Abra Camps. Mm -hmm. uh, Abra Camps is like, the, like a big uh, conference for minority uh, students in science. Uh, and then I won a travel award. So I went to that conference and then I got to meet different um, universities and different professors that were there so you just ask, ask, ask questions ask all the graduate students where do they rank um in terms of programs uh what and then you go into the website and then you go into like each specific pi what are they working on mm -hmm. uh, and that's basically like comparing and then you kind of trust what the website says so we're one of the top ranking programs in this <laughs> so i'm like okay and like i said uh, UT Austin was like an like an afterthought, right? Um, so <laughs> okay, okay. That's how I did it. Just a lot of asking questions, asking other grad students, professors. Mm -hmm. They know. They, they, a lot of times they know okay. which ones are the best programs, and they want to help the students. 
Okay, and that makes sense. So another thing I wanted to ask about, so you said that you, you quit your PhD program after your first semester. So did you quit knowing that you were gonna go back to Puerto Rico to do like this professional development stuff or, or what was like the thought process like when you were quitting? Did you, did you not know like what the next steps would be or did you like just like know that you didn't wanna do this? When I first, uh, when I ended like that second semester, Mm -hmm. I had already applied the month before for a professional development. Just I took I, like education in, in elementary school of math and science. I took English composition uh, and some courses like that. Uh, but I, after I finished the second semester, I started applying for jobs to see if I could stay in Austin and not have to go back home. Ah, uh, but I didn't get any jobs. I think I got one interview and it was my first interview ever. And it was a terrible interview. Of course, I was not gonna get the job. Uh, so didn't get a job. I had to return home um, and do stay a year. I don't know, studying, um, trying to find a job, whatever I could find. I think I found a tutoring job for $5 an hour, mm -hmm. but it was like, what I could find. So that's what I took. Yeah. Okay, okay, fair enough. So you're in your MPH program now. Um, I see that you were, you had a position as a data collector for the University of Texas Health Science Center. So how did you get this and uh, what did you do in it? Yes, so um, because this time like my master was gonna be different, right? Uh, for the PhD, they were paying me to, to go to school. Uh, I was, I didn't go into any student debt, um, but then for my master's, I, I did go into debt uh, to complete my master's. So I knew that whenever I graduated, I had to find a job as soon as possible. Uh, and because I learned that when I graduated, that when I finished my second semester of the PhD, that I was like trying to interview and look for jobs, like it was really hard. Mm -hmm. Uh, and especially because I didn't have any practical experience like in, in, in a private uh, in industry, right? So I thought it could be similar from when I graduated with my master's. Mm -hmm. So as soon as I got in, I started asking professors, other students, what's open, what's available, like, like desperate, like I need to find mm -hmm. something that would get me experience since the beginning because the master's is only two years, right? Mm -hmm. Compared to your bachelor's, which is four. Mm -hmm. So you have less time to make those connections, to network, to, to get the experience before you graduate. So uh, I think one of the students let me know about the data collection position. Uh, and then I applied and I got it. It wasn't, it was mostly like, a, like an hourly thing that you would track your hours. But something was better than nothing, mm -hmm. um, and that's how that's how I I, I got that uh, data collector position. Just asking, yeah. Yeah, and and that makes sense. And you definitely had like the end in mind, not wanting to go through and go through the program and not have a job, and really being proactive yeah. to make sure that you build those experiences so that you are yeah. able to get that job af afterwards. So, what what kind of data collection did you do? Uh, it was um, for a program called CORD. Um, it, it was like an obesity prevention program in, in schools. Mm -hmm. So we would just administer questionnaires on their eating habits, uh, their exercise habits, and doing uh, measurements like waist measurements, height, uh, weight, that type of data collection. Okay, okay. that makes sense. And then also during your MPH, you, had, you were a graduate research assistant. So how, how did you get this? So there, right, because I wanted in-state tuition. <laughs> uh, because when I went into the state, I, I had out-of-state tuition. And I could only get in-state tuition if I worked at least, I think, was it 20 hours or something? Okay. So I needed the data collection position since it was hourly that you would just track. I, I didn't need that. I needed like an actual position. So again, 
asking people. By then, by the first semester, I had developed an interest in physical activity and chronic diseases. So I went into and asked um, professors that had uh, some sort of like research in that area. And I asked them, oh, when is, do you think a position is gonna become available? Well, the students graduating in, in December, They're, it's gonna open in by January. So I'm like, yeah, I'm very interested. So yeah, and, and that's how I got that position. It's just asking people, you have to ask, because if you don't ask, you're never gonna find out where the positions are. Uh, and you want a position, you want to get the experience. And if, if it's paid and it's, if it's going to get you in state tuition, then, I mean, have no fear. Absolutely. And if the professor that you ask don't have a position open, they might know another professor that has a research project with positions open. Absolutely. That is absolutely so true. And people, I, I feel like people aren't as proactive as they could be to get positions and just, just take that, that advice. Cause that, that is really great advice. Um, you know, um, why I was, why I was that proactive, it was because I didn't want to go home after graduation. Right. And I knew that if I didn't find a, a job after graduation, like, in Austin, then I would have to go home and do the job search from Puerto Rico. And I thought at the time that it was going to be harder for me to find a job uh, from there than actually in the um, in Austin. So that's why I'm like, yeah, I knew this happened to me before. I couldn't find a job. I had to return home, and I know it was harder, uh, right? So I I guess I learned. <laughs> from my previous experience that, that that's what happens. And one of the things that I did that, that because I didn't find a job immediately mm -hmm. after graduation from my MPH, I estimated that it was gonna take me around seven months mm -hmm. to find a job. Uh, and it was, it took me seven months right, to find a job. So it's also like planning for that job hunting period because you have to think that job hunting period as part of your program. Mm -hmm. So you have to plan for that. So that's what, what I did. And, and I did something that no one recommends, right? Like no one recommends. I, max, I took the maximum amount of student loans that I could get. Um, and of course, like I measured the risk, right? Like it was gonna be gaining interest, mm -hmm. but the, with the money that I didn't, use like I would save like I didn't touch it because that was that money was was gonna help me live in Austin while I was doing my job search mm. so that that's what I did it's not something that I recommend right because mm -hmm. no one recommends that mm -hmm. but I knew that I didn't want to search for a job while back home because I know I knew it's gonna be harder so, yeah but, yeah, I absolutely understand. And that's like an opportunity cost and, and you just knowing yourself in, in that sense. And at least you plan for it um, probably better than other people knowing that you're going to need some time to, to have some, um, some wiggle room to, to survive while you look for this job. And I, I think that that is a really, really uh, good of you to, to, to like push so hard to to put yourself in that kind of position and risk that to, to get that reward. And, and I'm glad that you were able to get that reward. So what, what made you um, firstly think like why, why it would take you so long to get a job after graduation? Because at the time I was paranoid because you know how, how you have to sign that note uh, when, on your student loans, like you have to pay it back. Like it's not, this is not something that goes away with bankruptcy uh they're, they're they follow you until death like i was so i signed that student loan that yeah i'm gonna get that money but i'm gonna have to pay it back like really like i i, I almost don't go into my master's because i didn't want to do student loans mm -hmm. uh, but i did that understanding that was what's gonna happen i was gonna pay it back and uh, and reading. So I was reading like a lot of, oh yeah, people, students that couldn't find a job immediately after graduation. Uh, 
right? Especially in public health, like if you don't have experience, it might be a little bit harder uh, to get into the field. Uh, and, and I guess I watched a lot of YouTube videos about bad experiences uh, with not finding a job. Mm -hmm. So I kind of like, well, what if that happens to me? Mm -hmm. Right. Like, because I can be very optimistic. Yeah, no, I'm going to find a job in a month. Actually, no, I'm going to find a job. I'm going to graduate with a job already waiting for me. Mm -hmm. I mean, sure, it can happen. And I, I, and I started applying before graduation, mm -hmm. but it's just, it, it wasn't like that. So yeah, you have to just, you're not going to plan for everything that could happen. But that is a, a big possibility is that you won't, it will take you about six months, right? For some reason, they give you, of course, the connection that I'm making is probably completely wrong, but they give you six months to, to, for you to find a job, right? Like before you have to start paying uh, back your student loan. So I kind of like, well, if I have to uh, start paying my loans is six months after graduation, and I'm just gonna add one more month, one more month uh, to survive. So, I know maybe if I would have given myself three months, mm -hmm. then I would have found a job in three months, <laughs> right? Like it, it depends on what uh, what degree of desperation or or drive you have. <laughs> yeah, definitely. But <laughs> but you're definitely planning planning for the uh, worst, but hoping for the best. And at, yeah. at least, yeah. so you you set yourself up. For, for the worst case scenario which is which is pretty smart of you in, in like hindsight looking, looking back on that so how how were you looking for jobs okay so you you became the bilingual nutrition educator educator for capital area food bank of texas so what was the job process like looking for jobs before this and then how do you come across this job yeah so like i had this idea of like if i study epidemiology I have to search for jobs uh, for epidemiology, you know, that positions for epidemiologists, like entry level or epidemiological specialists. And I did that, but that's when I realized, well, epidemiology, there are a lot of jobs, but there are not that many entry level jobs. Mm -hmm. So I think three months in that I had, I was only applying to epidemiology related positions. I'm like, yeah, no, I'm going to open my, I'm gonna uh, open my job search uh, to other things. Uh, and then I started looking into more public health related jobs, like general public health. And that's when I found, uh, I started looking into nonprofit and I found the job posting at the, for the food bank, uh, public health, I'm sorry, um, bilingual nutrition educator. Uh, and I saw the requirements and I met them. Uh, so I applied and yeah, I, I'm, uh, I was glad that I got it. I was so happy. Yeah. Did, did they, did they interview better this time? Did you do better in your interview process? Yeah. Yeah. I you did. Felt, felt more confident. I did. I did because, um, uh, one of the things that I had to do was to prepare beforehand a presentation. Hmm. So I could prepare that way too. Yeah. And, uh, I was. Um, reading because I took a job um, it's not a job a book from the library on how to prepare for interviews mm -hmm. so I just read it and I kind of knew what type of questions to expect mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah and my professors and other mentors from my master's also show me like how to tailor your application um, for the position that you're applying like creating like a matrix mm -hmm. um of like everything that they ask and then uh you would get like all your experience and then you would try to match mm -hmm. uh yeah. for every single thing that they ask you have an experience that you can talk about so mm -hmm. i prepared that way yeah it, it wasn't it, it was good yeah better better <laughs> <laughs> that's that's good to hear and that matrix ideas are actually a really smart idea to to match up like what they're asking for and what you have and get like those stories and ideas prepared that so you can talk about it during the interview process so what did you do in this uh position 
Uh, so that one, it was, um, I had to follow a curriculum that was, that's already established, uh, like the choices uh, curriculum. And then I had to test recipes. It was a great job. It was a, a great job. I had to test recipes. I had to modify the recipes. I had to prepare like the presentations uh, and give our classes to a, a different, uh, like, um, to different populations from uh, men that were in recovery centers, like for addiction, uh, schools, and their parents. I, I mean, schools, kids, uh, and their parents, uh, people with disabilities. So everything is like you have to adapt the curriculum to this these different populations. Um, so that's basically what what I did uh, provide nutrition education uh, based on my plate and the choices uh, curriculum uh, for for this different uh, uh, the different populations and some of them were uh, Spanish speaking only. Okay, and do do you have like any um, takeaways or learnings that you got from having to take that information and, and like transfer it to different populations that might have different like cultural competencies and different like lifestyles and whatnot? That position really taught me a lot mm -hmm. because I had to learn how to deal, how to interact, how to work with uh, sometimes like. Um, not as uh, populations are not as receptive, right? So you're there giving a class while the audience might not be as receptive, maybe because for example, in the recovery program, they are made to take those. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's not like they're going voluntarily. Mm -hmm. um, so it was really, really interesting. In terms of what I learned, it, it really helped me a lot uh, with what I'm doing now. Uh, and that is to deal uh, how to work with different people. Mm -hmm. And like, that's, yeah, that's something that you're not, you might get it, right? Working in academia in a research project, but it's always gonna be the same population, right? Because that's why it's the research you're studying uh, or trying to influence like a specific group. Mm -hmm. uh, with the nutrition education experience, like you never knew uh, but uh, today I'm teaching kids, in elementary school kids, but then tomorrow I might be teaching people like adults with disabilities. Mm -hmm. So it helps. Um, yeah. It, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to explain because it's, it's something that, that you really learn like while there. It's like mm -hmm. managing expectations, right? Uh, how you approach people, how you speak to them. How are you reacting when someone tells you something that you don't like or it, you feel it's aggressive? Mm -hmm. It's you learn by doing. You learn by being in that in that uh, scenario. Yeah, absolutely. And it's like you need to get that practical experience with with populations, or dealing with different populations, because people are people, you know. And um, dealing with people isn't isn't the easiest thing to do. And as public health professionals, we uh, a lot of the time have to deal with like uh, different people, and people usually not in the best of situations. So, yeah. So that's definitely a great learning experience there. So after yeah. this, after this, you were a CDC CSTE Applied Epidemiology Fellow. Um, at the Hawaii State Department of Health. So how, how do you like come across this one, this position? So that one, I found out about it because one of the, of the students in my program was applying to it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then at the time when I found out about it, I, I thought, oh, maybe I should apply, right? In my, in my third semester of, of the program, I'm like, maybe I should apply. Uh, but then I was like, no, the fellowship is very competitive. Like, I'm not gonna apply. I'm never gonna make it. Um, so then I didn't apply that year. Um, so it wasn't until, yeah, I just focused on getting the experience like to find a job. But it wasn't until the spring, my, my fourth semester that I found out that the person that applied, the student got it. And that's when I'm like, 
I went full stalker mode. Like, <laughs> uh, like I talked to him, oh, what do you do? Like, what type of experience did you have? And I started to compare myself, my experience to his experience. Mm -hmm. And I realized that I had similar experience as him. As him. So, and that's when I did, I became determined, okay, I'm going to apply for the next round. Because when you look at that fellowship, it says you, you, you can apply if you are within five years of graduation, that you're still a recent graduate. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay, I can apply next year. So that's what I did. I, I, like I said, I went full stalker mode. I looked to the class, the fellows that mm -hmm. had already uh, gotten the fellowship. I linked, I went to LinkedIn, look at their experience. What did they do? What did they have? And I tried to get that experience. So I can be competitive. Um, so yeah, I applied. I, I I applied and I got it. Well, seven months. I found out. Um, yeah, I was a bilingual nutrition educator, and I finally found out that I got it, and uh, I had to be matched with my host site. Um, and yeah, I matched with Hawaii. And I moved to Hawaii in that August, like seven months after starting the bilingual nutrition education educator position. Okay. Yeah, I really, really, really love that. I love that uh, you stalked them. You found out like what experiences they had, what you looked at like past fellows. You looked at what experiences they had, you looked them up on LinkedIn. You looked at what they used to do and you try to like, get experiences that emulate that and I, I try to tell people to do that all the time because LinkedIn is a huge resource you can just look and see oh look at them they did this role this is the kind of things they did there and you can always reach out to people because they love speaking about themselves so so <laughs> like wow that I'm I'm really glad you said that like I kind of got kind of like goosebumps while, while you were saying that but that, that is awesome that you, you use that because I, I think that that is like one of the best ways to to find out like what you want to do in public health and how we can get the types of experiences to get there just looking and stalking and, and, and um yeah. Uh, yeah, that's awesome and, and it's not crazy stalking right like I'm psycho stalking someone of says no it's like you want to to be to make yourself competitive and what better way than to imitate or, or try to get a similar experience as someone as someone that already has what you want right yeah that, that was absolutely brilliant and that's definitely going to be cut and put onto instagram so thank you for sharing that <laughs> um so what, what what was the application process like for that actually so the application uh so it, it, it was different stages of the application. First, you uh, like apply electronically, like letters of recommendation, like personal statement as to why you want the fellowship. Uh, I believe transcript too. Uh, like I can't remember very well, but, but it's a general electronic application. Mm -hmm. uh, and then if you make it to the second round, then, well, at the time in 2015, then they were flying the candidates that made it to the second stage to Atlanta for an interview mm -hmm. uh, with the uh, with the people uh, directly working with the with the fellowship at the CSD, uh, and then they would ask you uh, why you won the fellowship, what previous experience uh, you had, uh, and I remember going there. And, 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 and getting out of the interview and like, I blew it. I blew it. I only had one chance. You had already passed the written application uh, because I was so honest in that stage. When they asked you, when they asked me, why do you want the application? Why do you want to be the, a fellow? I told them, like, I told them so honestly because I'm having a hard time finding a job in epidemiology, mm. right? And I really want to work for a local or state department. And the fellowship will give me the experience that I need to find a job, mm -hmm. right? And then I told them about my failed PhD, 
mm-hmm. um, right? And and it's interest. It's interesting because in that interview, I wanted to do everything perfect, like to have the perfect answers, like I buy the book, what do they want to hear? Uh, and then I remember that it slipped my mouth, like that, oh, I, I, I wanted to study medicine, but then I didn't. Uh, and then I remember when I said that, they were looking down. And when I said that, they all, like, uh, their head went up, like paid attention, and and they uh, they asked me, oh, why did you want to study medicine? What happened? And that's when I had to tell them about my failed PhD experience. So it's just sometimes they want honesty, like they really want to know sincerely why you want the fellowship. Um, so I passed that round, and then the third round was the matching process, mm-hmm. right? Because the CST fellowship is, uh, it's based on the EIS uh, program uh, from CDC. So there is a matching pro- uh, process that you have. Uh, at the time I interviewed with four host sites uh, and then you had to match three of them. So it had to be one one uh, Whoever you match, that's where you would get place uh, and then that was the final the final stage of the application and then uh, if you match then okay then you become a fellow you start in that uh, host site okay yeah no, that's awesome and, and, and I feel like when you do get to those like final stages of fellowship programs they, they already know like everything you've done on paper then and, and they know that you you're qualified and you'll do well in in the position they just want to know you more personally and see how how you how and what value this fellowship will bring bring to you so yeah so, yeah, so, awesome. so what, what what did you do in this fellowship uh so we have certain competencies that we have to meet for the fellowship um so we have to do like a surveillance evaluation we had to do a major pro project, uh, and that is going to be based on uh, the area that you apply to, because for the fellowship, there are different areas in epidemiology that that you apply to based on your interest, uh, what you want to do. There's uh, infectious diseases, there are infectious diseases foodborne, infectious diseases uh, HAI, like healthcare associated infections, there's chronic uh, diseases. Uh, I believe environmental health, like there are different areas uh, that you can apply uh, for for the epidemiology fellowship. So my position uh, was general infectious diseases. Uh, so I everyone has to do a surveillance evaluation. Everyone has to be involved or help uh, for an or an out for an outbreak investigation if it happens during your fellowship. Um, and then a major project. And since I was a general infectious diseases, I was able to kind of tailor w- what I wanted to do with my interest, yeah. right? Like, so within the infectious diseases, my project was related to disaster epidemiology. So I had to do a CASPER, that is a community, um, a community assessment, for public health emergency response, uh, it might be might be ex- it might be escaping the, <laughs> that acronym, but it's something like that. Yes, okay. it's, it's a community assessment for for public health emergency response, uh, and uh, that's what I did. That was my major project. Okay, okay. And general, yeah, general, getting to know the culture of the of what is it to work in a health department and yeah, developing your skills as an epidemiologist okay and as and as an epidemiologist which um program language do you use like sorry, uh, which one like do you use like spss sas or oh. any, any of those or none yes so it depends on what the health department that you're placed on uses we use sas like uh, that's what we have mm-hmm. um but I know 
previous fellows, like they have used other programs like R. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's going to be either SAS or R. In school, while I, while I was in school, I used Theta. Okay. Okay. Theta. Really, really interesting. Yeah. I, know. I think that was, that's what uh, the University of Texas School of Public Health uh, uses, mm -hmm. like, like teaches mm -hmm. with, uh, that it's Theta. Okay. That's good to know. Um, okay, and then so after your fellowship, you got a position as a vector-borne disease surveillance and response coordinator slash epidemiologist uh, for the Hawaii State Department of Health. So how, how does that process look like moving from fellowship to uh, like a full-time position, I guess? It's, it looks exactly as if I was applying from the outside. I had to apply, I had to interview, I had to provide references, uh, I, have to com I had to compete with other people that were applying to the same position. The difference is that I had the experience from the fellowship. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, that is experience, right? <laughs> it it mm -hmm. is experience and, and sometimes we forget that experience a lot of the time weights more than what, what some paper in, in your like transcript, like mm -hmm. academic, right, your degree. Mm -hmm. so, so I guess I might have had that competitive advantage because of the experience. Okay. But yeah, I had to go through the whole process as if I'm applying from the outside. Okay, awesome. And uh, what do you do in this role? Because this is a role you currently have, correct? Yes, uh, I'm looking, I might, yeah, I'm looking to switch uh, to a healthcare associated infections epidemiologist. Mm -hmm. uh, officially, I'm not sure like when that will happen, but yeah, that's, I'm looking to switch very soon. Uh, but as the vector-borne disease epidemiologist, I did uh, surveillance uh, of uh, vector-borne diseases, reporting um, our positive cases to CDC, mapping the cases, um, like meetings, training uh, epidemiological specialists, like and being that li liaisons between the Department of Health our, our branch and the state lab. Okay, and why why is it that you do want to make the switch that in in your career now? Uh, I think right, like I feel like for the vector born, it's really it's really fun. Uh, but now I've been actually helping the HAI program uh, since August, like since before August because of COVID. Okay. Uh, and there I'm like, oh, this is really fun. And I, I'm learning so much that I kind of want to do that, like officially in, in that position. Okay, that, make, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. And uh, so you have a podcast, Mejo con Guanabanas, uh, where you're writer and producer for the last two years. Um, so what, what made you come up with this uh, podcast? Yeah, uh, so I guess it was like um, while working uh, for the health department, I kind of missed that education portion, like me educating the public, right? Like I kind of miss being a bilingual educator. Uh, and I'm like, well, that's a really fun thing of public health. And that's one of the things that made me fall in love with public health. So I wanted to explore more with like uh, public health education with a podcast. So um, yeah, and I decided to do it in Spanish because I feel like there's not a lot of information like in, in a fun um, way. Like, I mean, a lot of the Spanish podcasts related to health are very dry. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to do something that I could teach them about health and wellness, uh, but with, with stories and like more fun. Uh, mm -hmm. So they could uh, identify better with the information, yeah, and that's, that's that's why I decided to to create the podcast. Okay, so definitely, just you you wanting to teach and and give people good health information and wanting it to be like yeah. fun. Yeah, and because every time that I'm researching a topic, mm -hmm. I learn. Mm. Right, so I learn 
by teaching. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I've learned about so many topics. Uh, also, by digesting the information uh, for other people. So it's, it's a good opportunity for me, for everyone. It's just a lot of fun having a podcast. As you, as you know, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely, and 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 I, I absolutely agree with that. Like, I feel like teaching is is one of the best ways for you to learn and solidify what you've just like learned and and taken in it, it because it makes you question like everything that you have learned, and it makes you think about think about the things that you might have 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 had thought about before and I, I think teaching is like the best way to solidify any kind of like information and that's awesome that you're doing this and trying to spread that health information to the uh, latinx community so thank you yeah yeah nah. <laughs> <laughs> so i, I like just, it fun <laughs> <laughs> i'm glad to hear that so I, I just had a question here um i know you don't represent the entire latinx hispanic population but i just wanted to ask like what what sort of challenges do you see as a public health professional epidemiologist um in in these uh communities populations um i think one of the right like i'm looking at puerto rico because that's mm -hmm. what i'm uh familiar with and i'm more in tune with uh it's uh, gonna be like chronic diseases, like cardiovascular diseases, uh, like obesity. Uh, there's a lot of asthma uh, there, uh, it, and it's it's again it's it's, and I don't think this this applies only to Puerto Rico, but also uh, to other parts of Latin America. It's like developing new ways to get that information across mm -hmm. right that not necessarily the information right now is mostly through the media like the news like they would turn into the news uh but it's like trying to reach like the younger population like, mm -hmm. and, and that's why i think like the podcast it's it, it's a great way uh, to reach those populations uh i guess the podcast came as a way for me to to bridge the gap that I I, I think exists, mm -hmm. like, like in a way we're, we're all so busy, and it's the podcast is a great way for people to consume information, and they don't have to just be doing that, just listening the, to the podcast. Mm -hmm. They can be doing other things. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that that is one of like the great challenges in public health is getting that like health information in a relevant way to people because I know um, just in general, we don't, we, we aren't effectively or as effectively using like social media podcasts and all these different ways to get that information out. And we're kind of still using like a lot of archaic ways like posters and and those kinds of printouts yeah. and those kinds of things so it, it it is quite interesting and that dynamic does have to change it is it is i i do uh think that there is still um a space for like flyers and posters <laughs> just because like the for example the community some communities that i've worked with like they don't have social. cell phones right yeah. Mm -hmm. So they're not going to be able to, to be reached through social media. And sometimes that community are the ones that need the information the most. Mm -hmm. So that's by, by creating flyers in different languages, uh, mailing them in, uh, you might reach that population that, that we, sometimes we want to uh, get our message across. So, yeah, I see, I see the use for, for all the different like, platforms, like, TV, uh, radio ads, mm -hmm. uh, podcasts, like flyers, like email newsletters, social media. So yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but yeah, but like totally, we could be using more social media. <laughs> Yeah, well, but but I'm I am glad you said that though because there is there is definitely that need for those populations that don't have cell phones and other ways. But we should be able to get information out in all all different avenues and as as effectively as possible. So that that is awesome. Um, so where where would you like to see yourself in the future? <sighs> <laughs> right now, I uh, it, it, if I see myself, it's definitely not in the near future. 
uh, maybe 10 years or I don't know, 15 years, maybe go into global health uh, or uh, as a consultant, I work as a consultant. Uh, but right now I'm, I'm happy working for, for the state uh, and local, like just state departments. And if I move to other states, like I would I still like to work for a state department. Okay. Yeah, well, I'm glad that you're happy where you are. That's, that's an awesome feeling to, to know that you are where you need to be right now. So that's awesome. Um, so moving you along to the last section of the show, the Furious Five, five questions I ask all guests. Number one, what advice <laughs> you give to a student trying to pursue a career in public health? I say go for it. You know, like, um, especially now you're going to see a lot. Of, it's not going to happen like, like what happened to me that I found out about public health when I was almost 23 years old. Right now you are mm -hmm. watching public health everywhere mm -hmm. because of the pandemic. Uh, so if you think that it's an exciting field, go for it. Um, it's not like this all the time. <laughs> just, I just wanted to, to make that clear. Uh, COVID, uh, it's, it's, it's an event that it's making and breaking uh, public health careers. Mm. It, 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 it's something special. Uh, but if you have that interest in pursuing public health, go for it I, I don't see why why not it's a very rewarding field absolutely number two if you're talking to someone wanting to get into your position what advice would you give them oh I would give them like just roll with the roll with the punches like get as, mm -hmm. as much experience as you want like practical experience right applied experience like uh apply of course, like I'm always going to tell people I want to go into epidemiology, apply for the CSTE <laughs> fellowship, mm -hmm. uh, apply epidemiology fellowship, or there are a lot of fellowships out there too. It doesn't necessarily need to be epidemiology related, but fellowships are a great opportunity to get the experience you need that will set you up for the job, like the, the the perfect job for you, like the one that, that you that you want. Um, and yeah, I, I kind of like lost track of the of the question. <laughs> it was too furious for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think that that is perfect advice, and I, I echo that uh, a lot. And I think you answered the question perfectly. So, number three, what's something you are working on improving in your life right now? Yeah. So right now. It's gonna be organization. It's 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 crazy. It's like you you get so many things thrown at you at the same time that you just have to like figure out a way to like organize and keep all the balls in the air and not mm -hmm. drop anything. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm working on, on better organizing like everything that I have to do and uh, learning French, right? Because I know I said in the, in the, in not the near future, I might be interested, I may be global health. Mm -hmm. And of course, like I stalk people that have <laughs> global health jobs and they have French in their, in their uh, arsenal. So I'm like, well, I might as well start learning because you don't know, in 10 years, I might want to go into global health and I don't know French. And then I might not be as competitive as other people as might know French. So yeah, those are the two things that I'm working on right now. Okay, awesome. Um, number four, professionally, do you, do you recommend anything? Yeah, okay. So um, definitely recommend joining the CSTE uh, membership. Uh, because especially if you are interested in epidemiology, okay. they have a student pricing like uh, for students uh, to join. And, and uh, it's very useful, like very helpful. If you want to learn more about applied epidemiology, you can join different subcommittees. Uh, and then each subcommittee will have a monthly call 
Um, they will sometimes have webinars like that you learn. It's, it's one of the memberships that I'm like, yeah, every year I'm gonna get this membership. It's, it's so, it's very useful. It's very practical, very applied. So that's one of the things that I do recommend. Like any student interested in going into the applied epidemiology field, join CSTE. Okay. Awesome. That stands for Council of State and Territorial uh, Epidemiologists. Okay. Awesome. That, that's great advice. And I hope people um, definitely sign up for that membership. So last but not least, where can people connect with you? Well, they can connect with me. Uh, like if they understand Spanish or even if they don't, like they can follow me on Instagram. Mejor el, it's at Mejor con Guanabana. Uh, I, because my audience, it's mostly Spanish speaking. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm going to speak uh, mm -hmm. there, like in, in my Instagram account. Uh, sometimes you can see like the translation for my posts and then it will translate it into English. Uh, it might not be the, the, the most grammatically correct translation, but you'll get the idea of what I'm talking about. Uh, and then another place you can connect with me is through LinkedIn. Uh, there I speak English. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, and I'm trying to be more active in LinkedIn too. Okay, awesome. Well, people definitely connect with her there. And I, I definitely use your page as like a, a, a practice, like on my Spanish. Um, I'm trying, I'm trying to like one of my goals for 2021 is try, try to get a little decent proficiency in Spanish and to having that Spanish context with public health, I think is, is awesome. So thank you for sharing what you do. And hopefully I'll be able to fluently understand everything that you're saying um, by sometime next year. <laughs> Great. <laughs> yeah, go for it. Yeah. <laughs> practice 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 yeah definitely um so thank you so much for taking time to come on the uh, show tonight i really appreciate you sharing your story it was i think the most unconventional public health story so far and i think that you should like have a movie or like a book or something so i'll, I'll be waiting for that to come out <laughs> I'll, I'll take it into consideration. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much uh, for, for coming. Thanks for having me. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for joining me today and joining me for the entire year. I really appreciate you all tuning into this episode and any other episodes that you have listened to. If you follow me on Instagram, sign up for my email list or anything of that sort. Uh, if you bought like a cup or jersey from me, I really appreciate it. And I hope that everyone has a really great rest of the year and that 2021 has nothing but great and awesome things for each one of us and i look forward to just connecting and growing this community and just sharing great value and stories with all of you going into 2021 and and forward so thank you so much for tuning in and supporting the show i appreciate you all very very much and without further ado happy new year and i will see you all next year public health millennial out <laughs>